So my name is Donna Boyer, and it's hard for me to believe this, and it's hard for me to admit this, but this marks my 30th year doing product management. Um, so being here, it was actually this month, this week, that I got my first product job way back when. Um, and you know, to come full circle and to be able to speak to all of you today, super fun. Um, I love it as much today as I did 30 years ago. So um, with that, let's get going. Um, I let's get this going. Um, I'm going to talk today about product leadership in a turnaround. And really just more generally, product leadership when you're facing headwinds. Not specific to turnarounds, but the lessons that I've learned in turnarounds are just so broadly applicable that I wanted to share some of those today. So first, how did I get here? Uh, there's a lot of household name companies up here and startups of names that you would not know in between here. Um, as I was thinking about my trajectory, one of the things that really hit me is that I have progressively gravitated more and more towards turnarounds, right? And you know, it gives some reflection of like, well, why is that? What is it about turnarounds that um, have drawn me to it? And I think I've come to believe with someone who has loved, I just I love product as much as I do, I just feel like it sharpens your skills in a way that nothing else does. And sort of in true product tool fashion, wanted to share like the why and the what of what makes that so. So, thank you. All right, better? All right. So before I dive in, I just want to take a moment to talk about how I ended up at Weight Watchers. I've been at Weight Watchers about uh, four months and change now. And before I do that, just take a moment for like, why wait? Right? So I was working at Stitch Fix in the pandemic and kind of everything shifted to home and everything shifted to debates about were slippers shoes or not, right? We had lots of conversations about how to tweak our algorithms around athleisure. And in the meantime, I live here in San Francisco and it was quite literally just dark days, like huge fires, the sky was dark, big health equity issues. And it occurred to me that, you know, the only thing I know how to do at this point, um, like I can't cook, I can't juggle like limited life skills um, is make products. And I made a very conscious decision to get into healthcare because if anyone remembers kind of what was happening in those days, it became really clear that healthcare needed product people, right? So I did a big search on where did I want to go in healthcare and landed at Teladoc Health. And I was there for three and a half years managing the portfolio from neonative intensive care interventions to mental health to cardiometabolic to weight. And what I learned in my first role in healthcare is that weight was really at the center of all of it, right? Like weight is really critical to mobility, it's critical to cancer, it's critical to cardiometabolic. So then I thought, okay, well, how do I get closer to that, right? And how do I get closer to that going back to consumer, which is really where I've spent most of my career. Um, and looked around and ended up at Weight Watchers, and so why, right? So the why there is that, you know, Weight Watchers is a 60-year-old brand, and it's helped millions and millions of people live healthier lives. It was also really well positioned to lead innovation. It's the number one clinically recommended solution, and last year acquired a company called Sequence, which is the, was the leading company in uh, GLP-1 prescription weight loss. Right? And the innovation that's happening in, in weight loss is incredible. It's like a once in a generation type of thing with GLP-1, sort of Ozempic, which is probably more commonly heard of. And it's thought like, okay, if, if I can do that, if I can leverage a company that's been around and helped so many people and the innovation and bring together the old and the new, have an opportunity to really affect health at scale. And then it was just an opportunity to work with a really well-respected brand. And when I say when I work at Weight Watchers, pretty much everybody says to me, oh yeah, my mom did Weight Watchers, right? Like really well-known, really respected, and a huge opportunity to bring together all of those ingredients into a successful turnaround. 
right? And so what that means is really reversing declining uh, member growth and reversing declining revenue, right? And, you know, given that trajectory, I've come to realize I'm kind of like a moth to flames with that. So then the question becomes, well, why turnarounds? Um, show of hands, how many people here are currently or have worked in an early stage startup? All right, so a lot. So turnarounds are kind of a lot like early stage startups in a way, like managing your burn rate really matters, right? Moving quickly really matters to find or refine in this case product market fit. Um, and then in a lot of ways, like your worst day and your best day can all happen in the same day. Right? So there's just a lot of parallels um, and sort of like how quickly you need to move. You just have a lot more, um, tend to have a lot more members, right? So there's this interesting puzzle of you need to make changes, but you need to be careful who you affect. So at Weight Watchers, we have millions and millions of active users glo globally. So it means that, you know, moving fast and break things really breaks things. So there's an added piece of the puzzle. Okay, how many people have worked in a high growth or currently working in a high growth company right now? Okay, so turnarounds are nothing like that, right? So you'll hear a lot that high growth companies are like steering a rocket ship. Like it's moving really fast. Um, you don't have to have quite as much precision as where you're landing, but there's just a lot of, of power and momentum behind it. Turnarounds are kind of more like steering a boulder right? Like, it's kind of like you've got this big rock rolling towards you, and what you need to do is stop the boulder from running you over, right? And so there's just a lot of physics in that. Like, it's a hard thing to do. And then you need to push the boulder going into the other direction and get it rolling with momentum, right? And so it can be um, daunting, right? And it can be a heavy push, but it's incredibly incredibly rewarding. So, you know, I think the question as I was thinking about this talk of like, why of everything that I could talk about, did I want to talk about turnarounds? Because getting ro run over by a boulder, not particularly sexy, right? But the skills and the strengths required to stop that boulder, bring a team together and get everybody moving and the, like, the company financials in a different direction are skills that I have really come to believe make all of us better product leaders and better, uh, better leaders in general and better managers in general. So I think that is kind of sexy and that's why I want to go through that today. There's three things I'm gonna talk about kind of chalk talk style. One is leadership in a turnaround. Next is ruthless roadmap prioritization. And the third is decision making under duress. Right? And I'm going to do it as a chalk talk with the hope that you can take something back, whether you're in a startup, whether you're in a later stage company, or something in between, that you can come go back to your jobs tomorrow and have some things that you can immediately apply. Okay, so don't worry, I'm not going to read all of this. All right. Um, really important in a turnaround is creating a crystal clear path forward, right? Um, the most common question I got from people when I joined Weight Watchers internally is, why did you join, right? You're often joining a company where morale is down, right? Where you've got declining numbers, sometimes you're missing quarterly estimates, having just done layoffs. It can be really demoralizing and those reasons that I gave earlier about like why did I join, you know, the, the heritage brand, the opportunity to help millions of people, that's why everyone was there and is there. They're there for the mission. But what they need is clarity of first, then next, what are we going to do to turn around this situation, right? And often, like if you get your engagement surveys back from your, you know, your people teams, Often you'll see things at any size in any stage company that are like, oh, I don't really understand the connection between the vision and the work I'm doing. Or as a company, I don't have a clear, you know, we don't have a clear vision. And what I've learned from turnarounds is 
what that means is less about, and this is you know applicable broadly, is less about what is the North Star vision and more what do I need to do, right? Like how does my work connect to the path forward so I feel a connection to that company vision? And being in a turnaround situation has really forced that level of precision, precision around here's where we're going and here's the reason to believe and here's what we have an opportunity to do as a mission and here's what we're going to do this quarter, this year, and three years out and here's why you should believe that it can work. That level of clarity is the reason to believe that people need to see and it's a really good way. It's kind of more strategy in a way than vision it will often show up as like we don't understand the vision, but that crystal clarity is like step one, right? The next is reuniting a sense of urgency. You know, having <laughs> done this like turnarounds in bigger and smaller companies, um, often, you know, there's something that you feel like there's a burning, like you're going to run out of money. You're going to run, like their time is short. And there's something that's really high on your priority list. And you'll say to people, well, how quickly do you think we can get this done? The this being, you know, a decision or a next step. And the answer is um, probably about six months, right? Um, things have a way of slowing down, right? In any company, they have a way of getting more complex organizationally. They have a way of many cooks in the kitchen or a lack of clarity. Really, really important to constantly be mindful of reigniting a sense of urgency. There's a really big difference, though, between urgency and panic, right? And urgency and sort of frenetic energy, where you've got, like, people kind of going around in, in eddies. It's really, like, clear expectations. Like, when do you need a thing by, and what would it take to get there? And a way of getting there, when your teams have slowed down, is don't ask how fast can you get it done because you're going to get an answer like, oh, in six months, when in your head you're like, oh, in six minutes, right? And then you've got that whole gulf. A much better way that I've learned of framing that question is what would it take for you to get this done by the end of the week, right? And the importance of that is that it's not, you're then not debating how fast. It's just a way of reigniting urgency around here's my expectation of you, and let's talk about the possibilities. Maybe it can't be done, right? But it just gets people unstuck about thinking about all the reasons they can't. You know, it's often very real, right? It's often very real about they don't have the resources or they're waiting on this thing from legal or this is stuck in procurement or there's a decision that needs to happen, right? But if you ask the question that way, it gives you a way of helping unblock teams in a way that you are removing obstacles and you're not in this like, well, I could have done that in like, you know, no time back in my day, which doesn't help anyone, right? And then the, the last one I'd say is just instill a culture of psychological safety, particularly when teams are going through a hard time. They're just super skittish, right? Like it's really, people are worried about their jobs you know, worried about their jobs, they're worried about the company, they're worried about being judged. Anything you can do to create open communication goes a very long way. A thing about my role, and I'm sure about many of your roles, is people don't tell you the truth, right? <laughs> like, yeah, we can get it done. It's fine. It's good. Everything's fine, right? They don't tell you the truth. Um, so one of the things I like to do is encourage, like, what we call, like, spicy conversations, with little peppers, and a spicy question is a question that you think would might be career limiting, right? If you think this question is going to get you in trouble, that is the question you should ask. And just create a way of, in a forum, of having people submit those questions anonymously because it's critically important that you know what's going on, right? And anytime in a headwind, but also when things are going well, it's very easy to not understand, like, the real questions that people have. And often those questions are things like you never really thought of, or they're things like, oh yeah, that really wasn't clear. I didn't answer that. So anything you can do to make it safe for people to um, ask you questions goes a very long way. Uh, when I was at Stitch Fix, uh, we, we had some, some things happen where like mm, we accidentally sent 
a lot of money to a place that we shouldn't have, things like that. And we instituted um, SBH emails, something bad happened emails in the subject line, right? And just made it okay for, some, for bad things to happen. And for me, it really helped me because I would get an email with an SBH thing and I could just take a breath, right? I'm like, okay, steal myself, don't react because I'm just like, oh, by the way, uh, <laughs> Gnome's anxiety uh, image from earlier today really resonated with me because I just would just react to something. But that SPH where I had a, like a moment to be like, okay, I wonder how bad this is going to be. There's very few things you can't solve and there's very few things you can't fix if you create a culture, whether this is turnaround or otherwise, where you can instill that psychological safety where people will just tell you the truth. Okay. So moving on, next turnaround skill. Road mapping, you know, everyone talks about ruthless prioritization. In a turnaround, it's ruthless prioritization, right? Um, your opportunities, you have to pick well and you have to execute perfectly. If you make a bad decision, right, and you're not hitting your goals or you're not climbing out of the hole that you're in, the problem gets worse, right, because then you have to do more layoffs and you're more resource constrained and there's less you can do. So picking well and executing perfectly is paramount. So, you know, people will talk about creating laser focus. Um, in a turnaround and anytime you're facing headwinds, being decisive about what you cut is really, really important. You know, if I think about mistakes that I've made most of them will fall into the category of not cutting anything fast enough, right? Or putting something on the back burner. Back burner is just kind of like a cop out, right? Like, cause then people are kind of back burner thinking about it. It's kind of catching on fire on the back burner. Much, much better. Even if it's hard, even if people are gonna be disappointed, make the cuts. Like if it is not clear how that thing fits into that clear path, and you don't have confidence that it's gonna move the needle, gone, right? And gone really means like you're gonna remove everyone from it and you're gonna shift people immediately to the things that you have confidence in. Because it's a slow burn that keeps projects going. Just the level of organizational overhead that continues by having something on the back burner, it's the extra email, it's the once a month check-in. All of that stuff just takes mind share takes resources and takes focus away from the things that matter. Cannot emphasize this one enough. I have like a little sticky note about this because it is hard, right? But the thing that you have to remember is that I think the reason, at least for me, about why I've been hesitant to do it is like people have put so much work into our project. You know, it's kind of a little bit sunk cost fallacy with also emotion, right? Like people have worked really hard and it's just close to being over the line, right? And, you know, it's challenging to do. What you have to remember is once that product is out, once that next release is out, like you just, you have to take care of it, right? And so it's better not to start. And then the other thing on the people side, of it, because no one likes to abandon a product after V1, right? No one, like it's not good. Um, and then the other thing is people like to work on things that continue to get resource and continue to win. So as hard as it might be to shift people, if you make that shift quickly, it's much easier. Next is, is sweating the details. So Spencer just talked about this a bit. Customer focus first always. A lot of times what happens um, in very true in turnarounds is that you're looking for the next big thing, right? Like if only we had this, if only we had that. We're often the opportunity to reignite growth is just right there in front of you. It's the small, you know, A-B test wins. It's the copy changes. It's the little details that matter. And it's too easy to, you know, in the face of like big I innovation to forget about little I innovation. And little I innovation, especially in a headwind, but at every stage company matters a lot. And especially when you're already at scale. Right? If you're in, you know, in my situation where we have millions and millions of users, a small percentage change is a lot of additional money, and it's just much more of a sure thing than a big bet. 
And then the last one is just, you know, anything you can do to eliminate thrash, right, which is different than eliminating change, right? Change is going to happen. You're going to learn new things. You're going to get new information. But thrash is just, you know, the dots are not connecting for people and you're kind of erratically changing, which can happen both in a startup as the market moves or, you know, there's a new customer, new opportunity, as well as in a bigger company and a turnaround because, you know, you're just really trying hard to get to that next thing and have to be really nimble. So you can be nimble without thrashing. And the biggest tip I can say about that is one of the things that I've found is that teams feel like they're thrashing when they don't know how the pieces fit together. So there is that, that anecdote of, I don't know, like the three men and the elephant, right, where people are holding on to like a piece of the elephant. And there's one guy who was, I don't know, I have to look this up, but there's like one guy who was the, the tail and the foot and the trunk, but without the bigger picture. You know when this is happening when your team, where you think you're saying the same thing, and your team is like, oh, how come you're thrashing us? It's because you haven't created the picture of the elephant, right? So one of the most important things for eliminating real and perceived thrash is talk about the elephant. Talk about why you're doing a thing, and that will empower your teams to find different ways to do it. But the why matters, you know, at least as much, if not more, than the what. And then the next one is really, you know, there's a lot of, like, you want to push decisions down to the team. You want to make sure that your teams are empowered. A lot of what will happen is drift, is you'll hear, like, a pushback, like, oh, well, it was top down, or someone said, or I did it because. Um, and part of what happens is that there becomes a culture of a little bit of learned helplessness, right? Like, I didn't do it because, or I did do it because, I don't really know, that product wasn't a really great idea, but, you know, some very high level, usually me, person, told them to do it. Um, if you can use the words, like you can empower teams, but also expect teams to do a thing, it goes a long way, right? So, um, you know, when you're empowered to, like what that looks like is there's a roadmap that is really clear on how it's going to hit your goals. And like saying that is really, really different than just saying, you know, go forth and prosper, but just setting those clear expectations so that the teams can own it and they own the results is a really good way of limiting thrash. There is nothing worse um, for a team or for a team leader where, you know, your, your teams are off doing a thing and it's like 10 degrees off, but that 10 degrees perpetuates itself, right? And then suddenly it's not going to hit the goals. The more, and then you're really thrashing because you're like, whoa, help, right? So if you can actually set that up front, very helpful. And then my, just my last one is just make sure that when you're making decisions, you know what you are deciding, right? Your decisions are, you can get the right information and people will talk about this a lot, but what is the decision? It's really been interesting to me when, you know, it's like we're all in a room, we're all trying to make this decision. You go around and you think, wait, what do you think the decision is? And you hear different things, which makes it pretty impossible to make the right call, right, if you don't know what it is or to have the right data. So really make sure that you know what you're deciding. And then sometimes it's actually not a decision. So I, um, I am an, an and person much more than a versus person. But often, you know, you'll be asked about, can we decide between, is it speed or quality? You know, is it near term or is it long term? If you think about, it's both, right? It is near term in service of long term. Um, it's both iterative and it's innovative. Like if you think about it like that, you can actually remove a lot of the decisions that have to be made by just thinking about how do you change the conversation and make it an and, right? And then, Whatever happens, don't have steer coats. <laughs> no steer coats, right? Because it's like, well, who's steering, right? So if you can avoid and really make it sure, make clear that you know who's driving the decision, you know what the decision is, and you know it really needs to be a decision, that will reignite growth and reignite some of the like long-term time to decision gets longer and longer, faster than anything that I've seen before. So just to sum it up, right, strongly encourage like 
everyone to do a turnaround once, at least once, right? The level at which it sharpens your pencils when you, you know, in a startup, you are, uh, you know, cash constrained. In a, f a rocket ship country, you're resource constrained. In a turnaround, you're both, right? So learning how to navigate both is just a really, really great way to manage through all sorts of change. When you have to, when you are walking a high wire where you have to make the right decisions and you have to execute them well, right, it really forces you to understand quickly what is it that you're deciding. Um, what is it you're deciding? Why are you deciding? And do you even have to decide? And then last, like we all face headwinds, right? Like no matter how fast your company is growing now, um, no matter how fast you think it will be going in the future, like there's always those bumps and bruises along the way. And turnarounds really help you lead and build the team morale and confidence that helps you get through those. So having that in your back pocket, no matter how well your company is doing now, will help you lead through those war times. So everyone should try it once. And also I'm hiring. <laughs> um, happy to answer any questions after. So thank you.